because we respect and we appreciate the Bible as God's Word, God's revelation to us, um, the largest portion of our worship service actually, and I would say probably the most important part of the worship service is preaching. And our preaching passage this morning uh, comes from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians 4. We do encourage uh, members here to carry their Bibles with them to, to church. And if you don't have a Bible with you, then what I'd like you to do is I want you to look at the overhead and follow along with me as we read from the book of Ephesians chapter 4, the book of Ephesians written by a man who was a convert to the Christian faith. His name uh, was the Apostle Paul. If you are unfamiliar with that conversion story, uh, you can read about it in the Bible in a number of places, especially a place called Acts chapter 9, which speaks about the rapid expansion of the church of Jesus in the world. The Apostle Paul writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin reading at verse 1, and what we're doing this morning is we uh, are beginning a new series. We have concluded our series here, a multi-month series on spiritual formation, and now what we're doing with the agreement and the desire of the, of the council of this church, and particularly the elders of this church, we want to look at about a seven-part series uh, based on various scripture passages relating to pathways, core values, and strategic values. We have four core values that are found in the Bible, intentionality, commitment, Courage, compassion. We have three strategic values. A love for Jesus, a love for each other, and a love for the world. A love for Jesus points us upward. A love for each other points us inward. A love for the world and a love for the city of Abbotsford outside the walls of this gym points us outward. And we trust that these core values are not only going to be healthy for us, but these core values are going to be for our benefit so that we are a balanced church and a a church filled, hopefully, with vitality. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, let's begin reading at verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So what we're looking at here this morning is something that maybe we don't always think about, but is a very biblical concept and encouragement, and that is intentionality. Intentionality in terms of our faith and intentionality in leadership, as we're going to see in this church, and also intentionality when it comes to the ministry of the church. Now, each one of us here this morning, doesn't matter if you're from some other church or if you're outside the faith, 
or your member at Pathway, each and every one of us, according to the Bible and according to this passage, are called to be intentional, to be purposeful when it comes to our faith and when it comes to the ministry of the church. If you are here this morning and you know little of Jesus and you would call yourself, well, unchurched, you don't belong to any particular church, but you are here this morning, God, listen to this, God calls you to be intentional. God calls you to be purposeful. You say, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you can't keep living your life the way you're living, distant from God. God calls you to intentionally pursue His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, as a broad invitation, as a sincere summons, Jesus says, come, come. That requires intention on your will, an exercise of your will and a direction toward Christ. Jesus says, come, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, whoever would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That requires intentionality. Now, if you've been in the church for some time and you've been a Christian for some time, that intentionality also applies to you as well. We read things in the Bible like, pursue sanctification, pursue holiness, which without, no one will see the Lord. The Bible says, let us leave aside the sin that so easily entangles us and run the race set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. The Bible is saying, don't just sit there or just don't stand there or don't walk to Christ. Run, run the race of faith. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so the Bible goes on and on about intentionality in our individual lives. But what could be said about our individual lives and the intentions that we are to have with the Lord and also with each other in the world, this also applies to the church and also to the ministry of the church. Christ calls the church, and as we're going to see this morning, the leadership of the church always to look at the church and ask questions like this. Just who are we? Who does God call us to be? Where are we at now? Where do we need to go? How do we get there? What vision do we have for the congregation? What course do we need to follow to be faithful to Christ as the head of the church and so that we might live not only as a stable people but as a, as a people filled with vitality and joy? Leadership always needs to be doing that. So we're going to look at this morning, as we're going to look at this passage that focuses on the importance of leadership in the church. I'm going to be focusing on the leadership at Pathway, and I'm part of the leadership. If you come from another church, I want you to think about your own church. And if you're not a part of a church, then I want you to, to understand how the church is supposed to function for your benefit. Okay? So it's very interesting. I want to begin with this simple concept, which I just stated, but I'm going to state it again. That when it comes to the direction of the church, the purpose of the church, vitality in the church, in terms of its ministry in life, it begins, it begins with the leadership, with the, with the shepherd leaders of the church. Now, what does that mean? Let's look into that. Okay? Now, uh, again, if you have your Bible open, take a look at verses 7 and 8. Otherwise, look at the overhead. Here we read this. But grace was given to each of us, According to the measure of Christ's gift, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now when you read that, kind of maybe you're wondering, like, what in the world is that talking about? That passage that I just read is fuller, uh, more fully illustrated in verses 9 and 10. I'm not going to get into all the particulars of this passage, but this is basically what it's getting at. Jesus Christ stands at the center of the good news. It's called the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is the head of his church. We read in the Bible that when Jesus came into this world, Jesus had a three-year ministry with his disciples. Okay? Jesus spoke the word of the Lord, the word of his Father to the people. It was Jesus who ministered among many people, performing many miracles and many healings and doing much preaching, right? Jesus, at one point in his ministry, well, he suffered throughout his ministry, but he suffered especially at the end. He was crucified, he was put to death, he was buried, and then he rose from the dead three days later after he was buried. 
After he is buried, after Jesus rose from the dead, and we're going to look at this tonight in our afternoon, or this afternoon in our service as we continue going through our series on a document called the Heidelberg Catechism, we see in Jesus' resurrected state that for 40 days on this earth, he preached the kingdom of God, but also what he did is he also um, gave resurrection appearances to demonstrate to people that he indeed did rise from the dead. After he rose from the dead and he ministered on this earth for 40 days, then he did what? He ascended into heaven, and then what happened 10 days after that? The Bible tells us he poured forth his spirit, and it was that spirit who energized and empowered the church to carry out its mission to the world, to proclaim the message of Christ to the world. But it was also that spirit who by his power gave God's people in the church certain gifts, certain abilities, certain talents that each of us here have. If you call the name of Christ, if you're walking with Jesus and you're a Christian, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit has given you a gift or maybe two or three gifts. You say, what kind of gifts are those? Gifts like mercy, encouragement, hospitality, maybe teaching. We read about those gifts in various places of the Bible, Romans chapter 12, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4. The Bible talks much about these gifts. We all have these gifts. Now, when it comes to this passage and focusing seriously on this passage, one of the gifts, and you may not ever think about this, but one of the primary gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to the church is leadership ordained leadership. In our circles, we call it office, an official calling of God upon men who are ordained or set apart and empowered for service. Now you say, well, who are those leaders actually? Well, take a look as we follow along in this passage. Take a look at verse 11. We read this. Now notice closely the language here. And he gave. Stop there. And he gave. Who's the he? Jesus. He's the head of the church ultimate authority over the church. He, and notice that operative word, it's a verb word, he gave. In other words, official leadership positions in the church that are so important are not something that simply arise out of the air and are what we call human convention. That is, that we decide, hey, we think it might be good for the church. Jesus himself said, here are these offices. Here are these leadership positions. What are they? Well, at this stage of the church, we read this. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Now listen carefully to this. You look at this and you kind of go, well, hmm, when I look at Pathway or I look maybe at the church that I'm apart from, if you're a part of a church, you kind of go, we don't have apostles. Why is that? I mean, do, do all of these things carry forward? This is why when you read books on theology, you will, you will hear theologians talk about extraordinary and ordinary offices. Extraordinary offices or extraordinary positions are positions that were uh, in place at that time many years ago, at the time that this was written, around 2,000 years ago. And one of the positions here that was operative in the church at this time was apostles. You say, why don't we have apostles today? Because the Bible says apostles are part of the foundation of the church. And once the foundation is laid, it's laid. It was part of a church and the foundation for that time. Since, when, since then, we build on this. We don't have apostles anymore. There's other positions here that for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into. But the point is, some of these positions in verse 11 carry forward. Some of them don't. The three offices or, or parts of leadership that we have today, ordained leadership, are these three. And If you've been raised in a church, this should not be new news to you. You have ministers, also called pastors. You have elders, and you have deacons. We read that elsewhere in the Bible, right? We see pastors here, we see elders in 1 Timothy 3, and we see deacons in 1 Timothy 3. Those are the official positions. We see them in the Bible, we see them in our confessional standards, and we have this document called the church order, and it's listed in there as well. Now listen to this. In this church, and again, many of you may be familiar with this, pastors and elders together are part of an official leadership position known as the consistory, and the pastor and the elders and the deacons together are known as the council. These are the leadership positions that Christ gives to the church. Okay, so much more could be said, but this is the main thing I want you to understand. Christ himself 
gave pastors and elders and deacons to the church as a gift. You ever think about that? It's a gift to the church. A lot of times when guys are nominated, they say, I'll stand for nomination, and they're elected into office, and then you think, well, I'm going to serve for three years, and then that will be done, and then other guys will be nominated, and then they come on board the leadership, and that's kind of how we talk about it. How about talking more positively in this way, that when God gives leadership to the church, that's a gift to the church for the blessing and the benefit of the body. Could you imagine, what would this church be like if we didn't have pastors or elders or deacons? What happened if no one preached the word of God to you from week to week? Okay, I can step aside. That means one of you have to fill that. You want to come up here right now and do this? Probably most of you don't, right? Pastors, elders, deacons, oh, they're so important, so important. And, and they're gifts and they're blessings to, to the church of Christ. And when you, at a congregational meeting, after a man has been nominated to office and you cast your vote to elect that individual, when you cast that vote, do you think, praise God, that we have leaders who are willing to stand to be leaders of this church, and what a blessing it is to cast my vote for who I think is most qualified, for Christ has given leadership to the church as a gift, as a blessing. All right, now I need to move on quickly. What are these leaders supposed to do, according to this passage? these pastors and elders and deacons, what are they supposed to do? Put verses 11 and 12 together. Take a look at the overhead or your Bibles. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. What is my task? What's the elder's task? What's the deacon's task? Not just to sit there and make administrative decisions, but to invest in you and to equip you, furnish you to do the work of the church and to do precisely what Elder Devin Dykstra prayed about. I don't know if you were praying with him, but showing intentionality in the way that we relate to each other and also the way that we relate to the world and the way that we're called to be a blessing to each other and a blessing to the world. In other words, we're not supposed to do all the work. We're supposed to equip you to do the work of ministry in the church and in the world. Do you oftentimes think about that? The word equip here is an interesting word in the Greek language. It actually, it actually refers to the, to the mending of a bone, the healing of a bone. Kids, or even adults, kids, you ever break a bone? If you do, you never forget it. Uh, when I was, I grew up in the U.S., we used to play sandlot football when we were 10, 11, 12 years old. Kids do that. It was always full contact. Inevitably, somebody had a busted bone. Your friend who busted a pinky, another kid who broke a left arm, I broke my collarbone. So if you would do this with your finger and run along my collarbone, it kind of runs like this. Now, is it healed up? Yeah. It's a kind of weird feeling. Yeah, but it's, but it's healed up. The point of this passage is really quite simple. When the leadership of the church kind of stands back and does not assess the ministry of the church and see need and equip individuals to fulfill those needs within the body of Christ, it's like a bone that remains broken and the body never really fully heals. But when the leadership encourages people and prays for people and equips them for service to the church and also to the world, that's where you have a healthy body. And that takes intentionality. It takes intentionality. Um, to kind of step back from this for just a moment. You, it is not unusual in the church of Jesus Christ today to see churches struggling in this way. It, and it, you know what? It's, it's, it's cross-denominational. There are some churches that are very intentional, and there are some churches that are not. And what's really interesting is that you can have a church with a very, a very high view of this book, very high view of the Bible, and you're going to hear words like infallibility and inerrancy and full authority, and we should use those terms. 
You can have a church that has a very high view of the Bible, very high view of the offices and leadership of the church, very high view of the doctrinal standards of the church. We call them here in our circles our confessional standards, right? You can have very easily a very high view of these things and yet be extremely weak when it comes to casting a vision for the congregation, providing direction, generating momentum, and accomplishing ministerial goals. The result is a certain level of inertia and stagnation, and sometimes just a sense among the congregation leadership that we have just settled in. We're kind of stuck. And if that happens, um, most often than not, the ones who are primarily to blame are the leadership. It's very interesting, isn't it, when you take a look at the Old Testament, you see the differences between King Saul and King David. Saul was a poor leader. and Boy, did Israel pay the price for that. But when you look at David, a man after God's own heart, when David was doing well and David was leading well, the people of Israel flourished, flourished. So if the leadership is not fulfilling its task of equipping the saints for the work of service, equipping you for works of service, then what happens is that most of the time the blame can be set on them. By the way, you also see this in the military. Um, sometimes there are books on leadership um, by individuals in the military. They were worth reading. There's not always, you can't always take a military book and apply it to the church. You can't do that, but there are certain principles that you can learn. One book, and I'll be very brief with this, is getting away from the Bible for just a moment, is a book called Extreme Ownership by two SEAL team members, Jocko Willink and a guy named Leif Bebin. Jocko Willink served in Iraq with a SEAL team, and one time, as they were fighting against insurgents in a place called Ramadi, they came under friendly fire. What that means is guys in the fog of war started to actually fire on each other rather against the insurgents. And in the midst of that fog of war, thankfully, nobody died, but when it's all done, the SEAL team members typically have a briefing afterwards, and Jocko Willink talked about all these individuals who are part of his team, and the basic question is this, okay, guys, what went wrong? What went wrong? And as he thought about it, he came to the conclusion that what was wrong was himself. He was wrong. He was the commander, and as a leader, he was in charge of these very things. And he writes this, and you put the AV if you put that up there. Despite all the failures of individuals, units, and leaders, and despite the myriad of mistakes that have been made, there was only one person to blame for everything that had gone wrong in that operation, and that was me. I was the commander. I am responsible for the entire operation. As the senior man, I am responsible for every action that takes place on the battlefield. Now, you can say, well, that just comes from a military perspective. Read your Bibles. You see that especially in the Old Testament as well. When the leadership is going well, the people go well. When the leadership is poor, the people are doing poorly. Well, why does that happen? Okay, I want to mention one final thing. It's gonna, it's gonna, I want you to put your thinking caps on here. Okay, I want you to take a look at verses 11 and 12 again, and then I want to draw your attention to something. Before I read that together, I want you to listen to this. Um, Many of you know this, but some of you may not. We have the Old and the New Testament in the Bible. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. New Testament written in Greek. In, in, in um, the, the, the English translation I have here is based upon a number of Greek manuscripts. And when you take a look at a, a Greek manuscript, maybe I should have made a copy of it and put it up here. But anyway, when you take a look at a Greek manuscript, um, it has no punctuation marks. Okay, so in school, when you're in grade school, you learn about punctuation, you learn about periods, and you learn about commas, and you learn about exclamation points and question marks and these kinds of things, okay? But the original Greek manuscripts don't have that. So what happens is translators of the Bible, as they put the Bible into English, have to provide periods where they think periods should go, and commas, and question marks, and exclamation points, and so on. Now, listen carefully to this. There's an old version of the Bible called the King James Version, some of you grew up with that. Or there's a Revari Standard Version. And what those two translations do is they supply a comma. Look at verse 12 between the words saints and for, or the words to do. So let me put verses 11 and 12 together. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to do what? 
Now, here's, here it goes in the King James and Revised Standard Version. To equip the saints, comma, for the, or to do, could also be a proper translation, to do the work of ministry. There you go, what are you saying? What I'm saying is this. When you put that, what one man calls a fatal comma, between the words to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, what you're really assuming there is that is the task of the ordained leadership of the church to, to, to equip the saints and for themselves to do the work of ministry. You see where this leads? When you have that understanding of leadership, then what you have is a congregation that just kind of assumes over time, well, the leaders will take care of it. They make the decisions, they administer everything in the church, they do the primary work, and so what happens is you have a top-down view of leadership, and what happens is that we then become passive, and the, the church starts slowing down. Kids are no longer greased, and it starts start kind of going to halt. Now, the translation I'm working with, some of you may have this, it's called the English Standard Version. It reads like this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of service. No comma. What's the difference? The difference is this, the leaders are not called to do the fundamental work of the church. They're called to lead, but it's really the task of the leadership to train you, encourage you, and organize you to do the work of Christ's ministry here or in your church, but also in the world. That's where you're going to find a healthy body. That's where you're going to find a healthy body. So always, always the leaders need to be saying, asking themselves, what are we doing? What are we doing? Now here, if you're a member here at Pathway, you know that the leaders are trying to do. We're trying to put in ministries in the church that are going to be healthy for us, and we're trying to employ you in the works of the ministry, and we have a number of them. Take a look at the overhead, if you will, if you put that up there, just a moment. Can you put that up? One more, one more. We have works of ministry and service. We have pastors, elders, deacons, greeters who take care of guests, set up, take down, AV team, worship team, admin team, visitor follow-up, orientation course, so on and so forth. This takes organization. This takes momentum. This takes encouragement. This is all part of equipping the works of the people for the church. Now, I want to stop here in just a minute and say this all may seem somewhat administrative to you, not always so personal, but it's highly, highly important. Listen to this. Jesus, we know that we don't build the church. You can, you can, you can put in all these things in place, but if, you're, if, if, if you think that the direction and the building of the church depends on you and me, we are all sadly mistaken. Jesus says what? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus, or I should say Psalm 127 verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Christ builds his church, but he does it through the instrumentality and the means of leadership who according to this passage equip you and me to do the work of service here in this place and also in the world. And you know what happens? What happens to the church that has that kind of perspective and that kind of intentionality? Verses 13 through 16, we're running out of time, but I'm not going to go through it all. But when you look at verses 13 through 16, what you see is that when there's intentionality in a church, what you find is a church that is stable, a church that is unified, a church that is mature, a church that is filled with vitality in a church that is filled with charity and love. And when you don't have intentionality in the church, the church begins to stall, and then these things begin to be compromised in a very, very big way. So, brothers and sisters, I leave you with this. God's desire for us in our personal lives and the ministry of the church is to be intentional. To be intentional in our personal walk with Christ Maybe some of you here this morning need to be intentional. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ, and if that's so, God's intention for your life is just to repent, to confess, to plead Christ, to draw near to him and become a part of a place like this, a place of a church where you can serve and grow 
God calls us to be intentional in our personal lives. We, we heard three professions of faith. The Carter, Haley, and Lauren. God's, God's call to them is God's call upon every one of us to be intentional, to be purposeful. And God calls us to be intentional in our marriages, if we're married, intentional in our evangelistic witness, intentional leadership, and intentional in ministry. And if we are intentional with these things, brothers and sisters, we're going to discover a level of integrity and vibrancy that not only guards us from stagnation, but infuses us with renewed energy to serve our Savior. Such is the Word of God for our lives this morning. Let's, uh, let's have a brief prayer together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for a blessing upon this church. Specifically, Lord, we pray for our leadership. I pray for myself. But we all pray for our elders and also our deacons as well, that you would give us wisdom, that you give us foresight, you give us a um, holiness, you give us a desire to shepherd your people, and you give us a sense of intentionality for the ministry of this church, for the sake of ourselves, but also for the sake of this world. And Father, we pray this that you'll be gracious to us. And Father, we pray ultimately that you would do for us what, which does not naturally come to us freely, and that is intentionality in our personal walk with Christ. Father, if we're struggling with this, we pray that you would re-empower us to look to Christ, to fix our attention on him, and to heed his words, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.